Good morning. My name is Heather, and we're so glad to worship with you here today at King Street Church. Today, Pastor Nathan Hand will be sharing the message, A Tool for the Way Forward. We would love to connect with you. If you're joining us for the first time, we invite you to come up after the service to speak with a pastor or text NEW to 717-401-7777. Our main announcements can be found on our website at kingstreetchurch.com today. If you'd like to learn more about our vision and ministries, we encourage you to pick up a church guide in the lobby. During our service today, we will be remembering God's sacrifice of us through communion. If you are here in person, we have prepackaged elements for you in the lobby. If you're participating online, we invite you to prepare your own cracker and juice there at home. Throughout August, we are offering the invitation to come and see what God can do through you. Each week, we are focusing on an area of ministry here at King Street Church where God is at work and extending the opportunity for you to join into that work. This fits in with our core value to be missionally engaged for Christ. Today, we are highlighting Welcome Ministries. This includes our team of greeters, ushers, and all those who help people to feel known and valued at King Street Church. We hope you will keep your heart open to joining the mission this August and see what God can do in your life when you make yourself available to Him. On Thursday night, our young adult ministry, The Porch, is meeting at 7 p.m. in the Student Ministry Center. All young adults are welcome, whether or not you attend King Street. Come and see what The Porch is all about this Thursday night. Our annual church picnic and outdoor baptismal service is on the afternoon of Sunday, September 5th at Norlo Park. It will be a great time to get to know other families here at King Street Church. Learn more about the event and all of these announcements at kingstreetchurch.com today. We're grateful for the chance to worship God with you today. It's our prayer that you would encounter Jesus in a new way this morning. Well, good morning. I'm Pastor Steve. Welcome to King Street Church. And I am so glad that you chose to be here this morning in the sanctuary and online to worship the Lord together. I'm excited as we worship the Lord together. And as Pastor Nathan, he's going to bring in the message this morning, which I really look forward to. He's normally over in Baker leading worship, but he's going to bring a message. So I'm anticipating what God wants to say uh, through him. And then also to celebrate communion. Uh, so I encourage you, if you haven't, uh, haven't picked up your communion cup, that as we begin to sing, it's okay if you want to slip out. There's a table over here in Rots Foyer and in the back. So make sure and get your communion cup. I look forward to our worship, and I encourage you to place your mind on God, to seek Him with all your heart, and we just trust that our souls will follow along, and, and we'll just sense God in our time of worship. So will you please stand, and let's seek the Lord together and worship Him as His people. Sing. I will enter His gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter His courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for He has made me glad. For he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad.
vision. May Christ be our vision, his spirit in us as we worship him, as we serve him in our worship. And we continue an emphasis about come and see. We saw a video uh, last week. We're going to see another one this week. And we emphasize how God is serving. You can bring that scripture back up because I'm going to read through that. How God is working in and through our congregation as we offer ourselves to him. And that's our call. As we believe and follow Jesus Christ, we are called to serve him. As it says in 1 Peter 4.10, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. And so in this video, we're going to see God's uh, faithful stewards in the life of King Street Church as they serve him. So watch this video. Come and see. I'm Samantha Wright, and I have the awesome privilege of serving as the coordinator of guest experience here at King Street Church. I just wanted to take a minute and share with you our vision for Welcome Ministries. One of our core values here at King Street is being relationally connected. Being relationally connected begins the minute someone gets out of their car and engages with one of our parking lot attendants. It continues when someone is warmly welcomed to church by one of our door greeters. It continues when an usher helps someone find a seat after service has started. Relational connection happens when someone at one of our welcome kiosks helps someone find a Sunday school class and introduces them to someone else in that class. Relational connection happens when our guest central volunteers help a family get their children checked in and to their classroom for the morning. Our vision is that our church will be a place where radical hospitality is practiced, so that everyone who comes to church, whether for the first time or for the 500th time, feels known, loved, and that they belong at King Street Church. If hospitality is one of your gifts, I would love to talk to you and see where your gifts could be used within our welcome ministry. Not everyone has the gift of hospitality, and that is one of the wonderful things about the body of Christ. We each have different gifts that enable us to serve in different areas within the church. However, we can all contribute to making our church a place where everyone feels loved and known. I would like to challenge all of us to be intentional and practice something that is called the five within five rule. Within five seconds of someone getting within five feet of you, engage with them. Simply say good morning or that you are glad to see them or ask them how they are doing. Our vision is to be a church family that shows the love of Jesus to each other and that is something we all can do. I am excited to see how God works through each of us as we seek to become more relationally connected through Welcome Ministries. Well, I encourage you to reach out to Samantha if you have the gifts 
and hospitality. She would love to talk with you, and we could use some help. So if you have that gift, uh, we encourage you to serve the Lord in doing that. In just a moment, we're going to pray together, and I'm going to lead us, and we're, just, we're going to thank the Lord for what he's doing in and through his people. But I want to read some scripture before I lead us in a time of prayer. And I, I'm sure it's familiar to many of you. I'm going to read uh, the first verse, and then uh, a little bit later in the chapter, it's Psalm 46. So hear these words. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way, and the mountains, they fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. And then near the end in verse 10, it says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. For he is our refuge and strength and ever constant present help in time of need. Therefore, we don't have to fear because God is our help. And so as we go to prayer, I just I want to mention just some needs in our congregation. And, and my heart, our hearts go out to, to you, Tammy, and to, uh, to Brian. And this week, uh, Tammy and Brian, their son, uh, Ryan, uh, he unexpectedly <laughs> died this week. And uh, we believe he's with Jesus, but our hearts are sad. So pray. Uh, for the, the Schoenliebers and the Cooks and the Dice. I see John and Carol and the Dietrichs in this unexpected loss of Ryan and their grief and their heartache. And then also just this past week, uh, one of our, a couple of our saints, uh, Earl and Almeda McLean, they passed away within a couple of days. And so this husband and this wife are, are with Jesus uh, within just a couple of days. And so we, we, we will miss them. Uh, we will miss Ryan and Earl and Almeida, and uh, there may be others that uh, I am missing, but we will, uh, we will miss them. Uh, but we are so glad we don't mourn as people who have no hope. We have hope in Jesus Christ. So please pray uh, for these families uh, that are experiencing grief and loss. And then also, I just I want to mention Haiti. Uh, I think we probably all seen on the news that there there was an earthquake, and uh, for the people of Haiti, and we have United Brethren churches. I don't know of uh, anyone specifically uh, as to how they have been affected, but we know that people uh, people have lost their lives. So pray for Haiti and the crisis in Afghanistan and the continued effects of COVID. Those who are sick. And we call upon the Lord who is our refuge and strength, our ever-present help in trouble. Will you pray with me? God, we are so grateful we can come to you. And because you are our ever-present help, help, you're our help right now, we don't have to fear. And God, uh, even though we are sad, <laughs> I think of, of Tammy and, and Emily and, and Brian and the loss of their, uh, their son, the brother, and the, and the entire family, the Cooks and the Dices and the Dietrichs, uh, the, whole, the whole family. In their sadness and their grief, oh, Jesus, be their ever-present help, their peace, their comfort, all that they need right now. Please, Jesus, help them. For the McLean family uh, in, 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 the, in their loss, uh, bring comfort, bring peace. God of all comfort, hear our prayers. For the people of Haiti, in, in the loss of, uh, of life, uh, loved ones, uh, property, uh, the, all the destruction caused by the earthquake and in a country who seems to just continue to be hit hard. 
Oh God, be with the people of Haiti. Be with our United Brethren churches. I pray that you uh, would help them uh, be light, to be help in this crisis. I pray for the crisis in Afghanistan and uh, just the, the evil uh, destruction. Oh God, bring peace. <laughs> Bring peace, uh, bring comfort. Uh, stop the crisis, oh God. Hear your people here in Chambersburg at King Street praying. We are together lifting up our hearts to you in prayer for these needs, for the continued effects of COVID and those who are sick in our congregation. Oh God, help us bring healing. Stop this virus in the name of Jesus. Hear our prayers, O oh God. Hear our prayers. God, we want to thank you for all the ways in which people here at King Street serve others. And we want to give you praise and we want to thank you. And God, uh, I pray you continue to... Uh, Work in the hearts of all of us and, and help us to know how you are calling us to serve you in these days. And not only to hear your call, but then to respond and to be obedient uh, servants, to be your wise stewards. Praise you, God, for what you're doing in and through the life of this church. Help us to continue with passion and determination to engage and bless our community right here in Chambersburg and around the world with all the needs, uh, the needs we just have been praying about, people who are, are sad and hurting that need your comfort and uh, all the various needs. Help us, God, to be the church and to answer your call. I pray for the rest of this service uh, in, in just a few moments. Uh, Pastor Nathan's going to come and, and uh, just be with him and be uh, with the time that we celebrate around your table. Oh, Jesus, may you continue to just come alive to us in this time of worship. Help us to seek you. And we will be quick to thank you for your answers to our prayers as we have been lifting them up over the last uh, few minutes. We will look forward to and we will anticipate and keep our eyes open to see you, Jesus, and how you answer our prayers. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's continue to worship in our time of giving. Thank you again. Can't thank you enough uh, for your generosity. Will you please stand and let's join together and sing to the Lord. I 
stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Let's pray, please. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this opportunity to once again be in your house and to worship you. And we just thank you so much for these beautiful songs and their meanings. And we just pray for the people that wrote them and thank you for those folks. And help us to apply these words to our lives. And now as Pastor Nathan comes, fill him with your spirit. Give him words to speak that we need to hear. And fill him with your spirit, too. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nathan Han. As Pastor Steve said, I'm one of the worship pastors here, and it's my privilege um, to be with you all this morning. Normally, I am rehearsing right now for the two Baker Center services um, at 9.30 and 11, Uh, but I'm so glad to be with you. I want to welcome all of you online. Uh, We have a big group um, online that worship with us at all of our different services. I think I have some family watching today. Aunt Kim, thanks for tuning in each week. Um, Just... I want you to know that I have a deep love and appreciation for this church. I know many of you might know me, but a few of you that don't, I I actually grew up in Chambersburg. I grew up at King Street. I came through the kids' ministry. I came through student ministry. I felt God's calling in my life to pursue ministry uh, when I was a teenager. Um, My wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, we got to serve together in student worship, went to high school together. We went to college together. And uh, now we're back here in Chambersburg serving as one of your pastors. And I'm, I'm so grateful to be able to have that opportunity. It's, our life's changed a lot in the last seven years when we moved back. It was just the two of us. And now we have four kiddos. Sophie, can you wave at everybody? You want to wave at everybody? But I'm so grateful to be here at King Street. And just a quick update, it's been really awesome to have um, different people preaching over the last few weeks. Pastor Adam was up two weeks ago. He did an awesome job explaining lament and what that means as the body of Christ uh, to grieve and to bring our hearts before the Lord as individuals and as a community. And then Dave shared last week our guest, guest preacher and encouraged us to pray. Obviously, I'm up, I'm up today, but Pastor Jody's back next week. Are you excited for Pastor Jody to be back? Yeah, I bet. Um, we have something special planned. I'm hoping that we pull it off. We're going to be interviewing one of our church members next Sunday, and it's gonna, I think it's going to be really powerful. And then on the 29th, uh, we're going to be ending our Come and See initiative. Um, As we've been showing videos, Pastor Jody is going to do a Vision Sunday, and we're going to preach on the core values of our church. And then we turn the corner, and we're into the fall season. Kids ministry and student ministry will kick back off with all the different things going on in their ministries. And uh, we're just really excited for what God has in store. We don't know what's going to happen in the world, but we're trusting that God will work through us, through the body of Christ, to make a difference in our community. 
And one last thing before I jump into the sermon for today, I'd like to just take a moment to show appreciation and gratitude. I think they're markers of a healthy church. Would you be willing to just put your hands together for Pastor Jody and our awesome staff, just an appreciation of them. I'm blessed to have the opportunity to work with a lot of our staff team, obviously Pastor Steve now. You're my boss, uh, which is awesome. Tyler's in the back, he's one of our awesome staff members. And I just, I ask for your prayer. Over the past several months, this past year, it's been really difficult in many ways on the staff level. And uh, we know it's been difficult for you as well. And we ask for you to pray for us as we continue to navigate this world, as we continue to figure out how to lead worship and how to preach um, with all the things that are changing. As we pray for you, we ask that you pray for us, that God continue to work through us to, to spread the good news of Jesus Christ around the world. Well, when Pastor Jody asked me to fill in for him a month ago, as you can imagine, my brain started racing. After I got through the doubt and the fear and excitement of him asking me, my first thought was, what should I preach on? My initial response to myself and a few others was maybe to preach on worship. I care deeply about all of us worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth. However, that's not where I landed today. Though hopefully at some point we'll have more messages and opportunities to preach on worship. Over the last few months, I've been taking in and processing all the different things going in our world, just like I'm sure all of us are. And quite frankly, I've been discouraged. I've been angry. I'm worried for our world. I'm worried for the, the world my kids are growing up in. And it seems despite our many challenge we, challenges we already have to navigate, that our world and society continues to, to run full speed further and further away from the things of God. The world is celebrating the canceling of people based on perspectives and viewpoints and sometimes trying to cancel God himself. And all those thoughts in, in my quiet time have led me uh, to what I wanna preach to you today. And the message of this morning is called A Tool for the Way Forward. Would you pray with me? God, would you speak through your word to us today? Reveal yourself and help us to do what you called us to do. Lord, would the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing to you, amen. Okay, so what comes to mind when I ask you, what are some of your favorite tools? What are some of your favorite tools to get the job done? Uh, maybe, maybe you're a gardener and you have a favorite gardening tool or a lawn tool. Uh, maybe you're a teacher and you have a favorite book that you'd like to share with your students. My wife, you've recently got into painting furniture and selling that furniture, so our garage is full of all kinds of paint and supplies. You can barely move in there with all the stuff that you have in there. Um, as a worship leader, normally I would have my guitar as Pastor Steve does today, my Bible, my computer. God has given us each individual tools for us to accomplish our task. And for a lot of us, we have different, different tools. But he also gives us tools collectively for us to use to build his kingdom and accomplish his mission. And the tool I want to talk about today is forgiveness. But before we can use forgiveness as a tool in the world, we need to understand the depth of forgiveness God offers us. So if you have your Bibles today, would you turn to Luke 15? If you don't have a Bible, feel free to talk to one of the pastors afterward or download version. It's a free Bible app on your phone. Luke 15. This is a parable of Jesus. Um, often Jesus in his ministry and his life on earth, he would travel from city to city or synagogue to, synagogue to home, and he would tell stories as a way of teaching some of his kingdom principles. And we're going to jump into verse 11. It says, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger son said to his father, Father, give me a share of this state. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. 
But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to the father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of, our, one of the servants and asked him, what's going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he had him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because the brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. It's an amazing story. I know many of you have probably heard this story today, but maybe a few of you, this is the first time that you've heard it. One of my natural instincts when reading scripture is always to think, um, do I relate or can I connect with any of these characters in the story? So I ask you that today. There's three main characters, obviously. The younger son, who's the sinner. The older son, the unforgiving brother. And the father. I think in some ways, maybe sometimes we can see a little bit of ourselves in all three characters of the story. But let's start, let's dive into the younger son. Verse 12, he took out his inheritance early. Verse 13, he left his family and squandered wealth in quote unquote wild living. He became a servant to survive in verse 15. Verse 17, he came to his senses. He understood he sinned. Verse 20, he returned to his father. Verse 21, he repented. In verse 24, he was forgiven. Let's look at the older son. He lived in the father's house. He served the father. And then you can tell he was angry, he got jealous, and he even was slanderous towards his brother. And then the last character of the story is the father. He allowed the son to leave with his inheritance, didn't force him to stay. Um, he had compassion, he ran to his son, embraced his son. Verse 24, accepted his son back into his family and celebrated him. And he even shows compassion on the, his oldest son too. He showed compassion, tried to get him to understand. This is a truly amazing story about the love and forgiveness of a father. And this is the direction that the sermon is going. That we could live and forgive like the father. To show extravagant forgiveness. But before we get to that, I want to ask you, do you see yourself as the younger son? Do you remember a time in your life that you were living apart from God? Or even have you ever asked God to forgive you of your sins? Or maybe you're a Christian, but see yourself slowly walking away from the father. The truth is, we're all like the younger son. We are all far from God, and we need God's forgiveness, which he freely gives us. In Romans 3.23, we, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all sinners in need of saving. What God asks us to do is to repent as the son did in this story, and we will experience the love and forgiveness of our heavenly father. I'm so thankful for the father's response. He said, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. The father's instinct wasn't condemnation or judgment, but it was mercy and forgiveness. I know that some of you today might be doubting that God really forgives you. Maybe you're holding on to the things you've done and allowing those things to separate you from God. But I want to remind you, it says in Romans chapter 8, that nothing can separate us from the love of God. I can understand it's hard to believe. We fail, people fail. The church fails, but God never fails, and his love and forgiveness is even more extravagant than the Father in this parable. It says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall never perish, but have eternal life. And in Ephesians chapter 2, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners or strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, 
and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a, a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by the Spirit. That is good news for us today, church. If we confess our sins and believe Jesus is Lord, we stand forgiven, part of God's family, a temple of the Holy Spirit, with a home secured forever, with the most precious thing ever, our God. Thank you, Lord. I mentioned a few minutes ago how easy it is to see yourself in these different characters. And more recently, I found myself drawn to the older brother. Not in judgment of him, but in fear, I'm kind of like him. See, he has lived with and served a compassionate and gracious father for many years, but found himself hard-hearted to his own brother. How did this happen? I want to invite you to think about yourself this past year. Have the things we've gone through and experienced changed your heart? The division, the sickness, the outside pressure, the disagreements, the frustrations in our country, our community, our church, our family and friends. I've seen it. I felt the anger and frustration. I felt the, my heart get hard towards certain people. I'm sure many of us have experienced these feelings and maybe even some of you today in this room right now. Here we are trying to do our best to serve the Lord and to follow after him. And people around us are slandering him or celebrating evil things. I get it and I feel it. But I want to encourage you today with what the father tells the son in verse 31. He says, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. I want to encourage you to not let our hearts get hardened to sinners that we forget God's plan and saving power, his character, his grace. Don't forget that God can do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine, that he can shine light in the darkest heart in places. I came, I came across a social media post a few weeks ago, which I was thought was helpful. It's by Ian Simkins. I don't know who this is, but this quote was really powerful. It says, the older brother in the prodigal, prodigal son parable shows that you can be in the father's home and still be far from the father's heart. God never intended we do for him without also doing with him. Activity is a terrible trade-off for intimacy. Service and commitment should flow from a place of love and close relationship with the Lord. It's when those things get out of order that I believe we begin to act like the older brother, self-righteous, self-serving. If you feel your heart hardened toward people today, or if your experiences over this last year have led you to judge people, I invite you and encourage you to take on the posture of the younger son, a posture of humility and need, and take those feelings to the Lord. Find mercy and compassion and strength in the Lord. Find the upper story, the story of God working even when we can't see it. The story where, story where he's bringing life from death and transforming sinner to child of God. For believers today, we know that ultimately there's no way forward without the forgiveness of God. And because of that understanding, we know that people must experience Christ's forgiveness through us. It's our tool for the way forward. It's one of our tools to advance the kingdom of God, to build and sustain his church, to be a light in our community. God speaks very clearly about forgiveness in scripture. In Ephesians, it says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God for, forgave you. In Matthew, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. In Colossians, bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has grievances against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. In Luke, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. In Matthew, it says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. In Mark, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your heavenly Father, that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. And I love this Proverbs. Love prospers when a fault is forgiven, but dwelling on it separates close friends. The Bible is very clear on what our response should be when we're wronged. It's forgiveness, but we all know it's not that easy because this world would be a better place if it was that easy, right? But why is that the case? Why is it so difficult? 
a little over a month ago, uh, as a staff, we read through a really powerful article uh, by Pastor Timothy Keller called The Fading of Forgiveness. It's an incredible, incredible read, extremely challenging. Uh, once we got done reading it, we all just kind of sat there and we were trying to figure out actually how to, how to forgive and how to reconcile in difficult times. But Keller in this article describes two ways in which our culture is moving, and I want to share that with you today. He says, while all other cultures have stressed the importance of community and the need to forge a personal identity that negotiates and aligns with the common good, modernity stressed looking inward to forge one's own identity based on our desires and then moving outward to demand that, that, that society honor our individual identity and interests. He then goes to quote Gregory Jones, if all that matter, matters is individual autonomy, then forgiveness and reconciliation which are designed to foster and maintain community are of little importance. Forgiveness is either discouraged as imposing a moral burden on the person, or at best, it's offered as a way of helping yourself acquire more peaceful inner feelings, of healing ourselves of our hate. So his first point was that there's been a shift to move inward. And his second point involves the rise of shame and honor culture. And he quotes Bradley Campbell and Jason Manning. Then they say, cancel culture, ends up valuing fragility over strength, creating a society of constant good versus evil conflict over the smallest of issues as people compete for status as victims or as defenders of the victim. It atrophies our ability to lovingly overlook slights, but most of all, it sweeps away the very concept of forgiveness and reconciliation. Forgiveness is now seen as radically unjust and impractical, as short-circuiting the ability of victims to gain honor and virtue as others rise to defend them. I take the time to reference these articles today because I see some of these cultural thoughts invading Christian minds and, and sometimes even my mind. And I feel like it's been heightened over this past year with social media. It seems even more normal these days that um, when you're wronged by someone, our instinct is to, to just say we don't need them or to cut off the community that maybe hurt us. Or maybe if one of our friends posts some, something or says something that we disagree with, we write them off or let, let it create a wedge in between us. It's easy to let these cultural thoughts, our pride, and our anger control us and control the way we see relationships. But I want to encourage all of us today that forgiveness is our way forward. It's what sets us apart from the world. It's what Christian community needs to stay together. But forgiveness is hard and it can be costly. It says in Romans 12, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed them. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Wow. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Forgiveness is giving up our right for revenge and putting judgment in God's hands. And that statement reminds me of one more story, a biblical story that I just want to touch on again today. And it's the story of Joseph. Um, I'm sure many of you growing up, I know I'm a little younger than some of you in this room, but in Sunday school, I remember the, the flannel boards and the Sunday school teachers, and Joseph was the one with the, the coat of many colors. He was the stylish one. But his story comes from Genesis uh, chapter 37 through 45. And I'm briefly just, I'm very, <laughs> I'm going to very briefly just hit on some of the key parts of his story. Um, he starts to have dreams about his brothers bowing down to him. And as a younger son, he thought it was a good idea to share that with his older brothers. So he began, uh, his brothers began to despise him and hate him for it. They ended up beating him up and selling him into slavery and then lying to their father and saying that Joseph had died. Um, and that's just a story in itself, but it continues. He then uh, gets thrown into jail after being falsely accused of taking advantage of a woman, and, but that wasn't what happened. Um, he's in jail, and he kind of starts to rise up the rank. He interprets some dreams, and eventually he ends up interpreting Pharaoh's dreams. Um, Pharaoh lifts him to second command in Egypt. Um, he uses the wisdom and the dream that Pharaoh had to to start to store food and supplies because there was a famine coming. And then guess who shows back up at the end of Joseph's story? His brothers. And there's this really interesting back and forth 
I encourage you to read it this week. Of His brothers didn't recognize Joseph, and uh, Joseph was, it kind of seemed like playing some games with his brothers for a little bit. I think he was trying to discern what he should do. Obviously, he was angry and frustrated, I'm sure. Uh, but they needed food, and uh, he provided food for them. And then he sent them away and asked them to bring their younger brother back. And eventually, after this back and forth, after some of the brothers cried out to Joseph to show mercy, Joseph finally reveals himself as their, their, their brother. And he says this. He says, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because it was to save the lives that God sent me ahead of you. In verse 7. God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. I think it's common for us as Christians sometimes to think of forgiveness as the right thing to do. I kind of just laid it out. It says it over and over again in Scripture. But I want to invite you today to think of forgiveness as a place that God can be at work. Can you imagine forgiving someone and that being the spark that God uses to change their life? Or your act of forgiveness furthering the kingdom of God? Or in Joseph's case, the story of God? It says in Ephesians 3, I referenced this earlier, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. My prayer is that we, kinda, we have that kind of perspective in regards to God forgiving us and us forgiving others that we can use forgiveness as a tool to make a difference in this world and that we would trust that he is working and doing more than we ask or imagine. I want to end this sermon today uh, by playing a story that I heard for the very first time just a month ago, probably a little over a month ago, about my grandfather. It was in this uh, same staff meeting that uh, we were reading through this article. Um, My mom, I don't know if you guys know, my mom's on staff here. She's a children's director. And she told a story about my grandfather that I'd like to share with you today. Recently, at one of our staff meetings here at King Street, we were discussing an article we were asked to read by Tim Keller on the fading of forgiveness. It talks about how our society is really turning away from genuine forgiveness and reconciliation. As we talked, many things were being discussed, and somewhere along the line, someone mentioned about how can someone truly forgive when they've been harmed in ways that are not easy to overcome? How can we reconcile with people who have harmed us? And suddenly something that happened in my life came to my mind and I shared a story about my dad. My father knew what it was like to be abandoned by his birth parents and put into the foster care system and abused at age four and a half. The couple that ended up raising my father did not treat him as they did their daughter. He was beaten severely for accidentally knocking over a pail of milk. He was more of a hired hand than son. I know there were more things that my father experienced while living with his foster parents, but dad was never one to talk much about that to me. You see, as a young girl, when you start to hear what your father experienced as a child, it impacts you. I was angered by how those people could have treated my dad so badly. I really didn't want to recognize them as part of our family, but they were included in many of our family gatherings. One of those gatherings was my wedding day. As I was preparing for my wedding, I learned a deep lesson about forgiveness from my father. As we were gathering all the different corsages and boutonnieres for the grandparents, my dad asked where his foster parents' flowers were. And I said, Dad, they are not my grandparents, and I don't want to recognize them as if they were. Not after what they did to you as a little boy. I watched my father's face turn to such hurt and disappointment He said, Becky, these people gave me a home. They provided for me. They are part of my family, and I want them to be recognized. I saw hurt and compassion in my dad's eyes, and I realized how unforgiving I had been, feeling I was justified in my anger, even though I was not even the one that had been hurt. Hard lesson learned on my wedding day. So quickly we reached out to a local florist and got an extra corsage and boutonniere made for them. I saw in my dad a picture of forgiveness, of total trust in God, for how God had worked in his life. Dad understood the saving grace and forgiveness that he received from Jesus, and he wanted all his family to experience that as well. He understood he couldn't hold on to hurt and anger if he was to point his family and friends to Jesus. 
He lived his faith boldly in front of everyone who came in, he came in contact with. My dad had the opportunity to witness to his birth parents, all his siblings, his foster family, and his children over his lifetime. His biggest desire was not to seek revenge or bring up pains from the past, but to see his family surrender their lives to Jesus, serve him, and spend eternity in heaven. My dad loved people, and he loved sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with whoever would listen. I truly believe that was possible because dad allowed God to work in his life, and he understood what it meant to be forgiven and to truly offer forgiveness. My grandfather was an incredible man, and I miss him deeply today. But I want to... I want to read one more time what my mom just said at the end of that video. My dad loved people, and he loved sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with whoever would listen. And I truly believe that was possible because dad, God, dad allowed God to work in his life, and he understood what it meant to be forgiven and to truly forgive. I'd like to end this, this message today uh, by having a moment to just respond to maybe a prompting that God has put in your heart often when I think and hear about messages or scripture on forgiveness, it makes me process and to think about a couple of different scenarios. And I just want to ask you, do you fall into any of these camps? Um, today, do you, do you find yourself maybe like the younger son? Maybe right now you know that you are living apart from God. You are living in sinful ways. And right now God's prompting you uh, to, to open your heart to him and come back to him. Or maybe you feel like the older son uh, many of you have been around church for a long time and served the Lord for a long time faithfully, but maybe over this past year, your heart's gotten hard because of the experiences we've had. And maybe it's just time to go back to the Lord and say, God, would you soften my heart? And would you give me perspective, um, your perspective on things, to see people the way you see people? Or maybe like a message like this, you know right away who comes to mind, someone that you need to forgive. And I invite you to bring that before the Lord now. Or maybe... Um, as my grandfather, you've experienced something in your past that is the, just a deep hurt, and you don't know how to, to move forward. And I, I don't have all the answers. I know this, this world is complicated and messy, but I, today I just want to point you to Jesus. His words, what he asks us to do, he loves you and cares for you. And so I would invite you today to take that, maybe that deep pain or hurt um, to him and open your hearts to him and just say, God, I don't know what to do, but would you help me know? So Phil's playing. I want to give us just a moment before we move into communion to respond in that way. So if you feel comfortable, would you just bow your, your heads and close your eyes and just talk to the Lord for a moment today and ask him to reveal a way that maybe you need forgiveness or grant someone forgiveness. Well, my prayer is that we continue to become more forgiving, that we better understand God's forgiveness and that we would share that forgiveness with the world. We have the, the privilege this morning of moving into communion. So if you're in the room today, please get your communion cup. If you're online, please get your elements. Um, and this is just a reminder that at King Street, we have open communion. So we just ask that you believe that um, Jesus Christ is Lord and he's your savior. And I think it's appropriate on a message on a Sunday about forgiveness that we move into communion and celebrate this. And I was thinking as Jesus was with his disciples that night, what happened to him? He was betrayed by Judas, who sold him for money. And then his disciples abandoned him and Peter denied him. But before that happened, with God knowing what was about to happen, he got down on his knee knees and he, he washed their feet and he served them. And then he took the bread, and I encourage you and to invite you just to open your bread cup and to look at the bread this morning. And he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Church, would you take that bread and would you eat it? Now, 
if you can open your cup. He then took the cup, and in Matthew's account, he says, Jesus says this, drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. So as we look at this, this juice this morning, we remember Christ's sacrifice on the cross and his blood poured out for us in the forgiveness of our sins. And I encourage you to now take the cup and drink. Would you pray with me? Lord, we give you thanks and praise for your sacrifice, for your body that was broken and the blood that was poured out for us so that we could be here today forgiven, that we could become your children, that we are a part of your family. And Lord, I pray that that changes us, that changes the way we live, that we would live like you, Jesus, caring, sacrificial, humble, Lord, that we would be forgiving, quick to forgive. And Lord, I ask that you would give us your perspective today on things, of people, of situations, that you would give us eyes to see people in need. Lord, I thank you for this time, and it's in your powerful name we pray, in the name of Jesus, amen. And will you please stand? And let's worship the Lord together. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied, glory to His name, glory to His name, glory to His name. Well, it's, so, it's been good, so good to be with you today, and it's been my privilege to, to, to be in God's Word together. And we probably know there's a high chance that by the end of this day or maybe sometime this week that we might need to forgive somebody. And I encourage you to do so. I encourage myself to do that. And I invite you today to take the perspective and hear this benediction from Ephesians chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. You're dismissed. Have a great week, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for worship today. We would love to connect with you. We encourage you to use the chat option to connect with your host. You can ask questions or request prayer. For those who live close to Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, we invite you to attend our services in person. We offer five Sunday worship services, which are listed on our website homepage, kingstreetchurch.com.
On that same page, you'll also find links to our weekly worship folder, sermon videos, and so much more. We're grateful for our online church family. Thanks again for being here with us today. We look forward to worshiping with you next week.